Our last stop on this New York Island Odyssey takes us back up to Pelham Bay Park in the Bronx, very close to City Island. From the 1890s through the 1960s, Hunter and Twin Islands were a summer colony for immigrants seeking refuge from tenement life. Many immigrants then and now can discover peace and solitude just a bus ride away from the rigors of city life. In the 1930s, Robert Moses created Orchard Beach by connecting Hunter and Twin Islands to Rodman's Neck in the mainland. Surprisingly, much of the original pristine island landscape remains and is very open and accessible to the public. But it still only hints at the breathtaking natural beauty that existed here before the white man arrived. The richness of the wildlife in New York in the 17th and 18th centuries was absolutely amazing. I mean, it's hard to believe now, but early travelers would report that you could smell New York um, before you could see it. And what you were smelling was not garbage and smoke, but you were smelling wildflowers and, and the trees from the, uh, the hills around the harbor. It was magnificent. There were pockets of Native Americans living on the fringes of European settlements even into the early 19th century. Um, I've seen reports uh, that say the last Native American inhabitant of Brooklyn, for example, died sometime in the 1820s. Uh, that's probably representative of other areas of what is now New York City. Certainly by the end of the 18th century, there were virtually no Native American communities of any real consequence in what we now call New York City. Hunter and Twin Islands were really um, favorite places of Native Americans at one time, and they were there for a very long time. And you could, you could probably still find arrowheads and all that there, but there was this guy named Ted Kazimiroff, a dentist who lived in the Bronx, who ends up becoming an activist and, and, and saving these islands from development or becoming a dump, which is really what was going to be done with them in the 60s. He used to walk the island. He was like a naturalist, like a self-taught naturalist. And he would walk the island. He found arrowheads and all, and um, looking at the wild asparagus that grows there and all these other great things. It's said that he came in contact with a Native American named Joe Two Trees. My father uh, was always impressed with nature. And as a youngster, he explored these woods looking for Indian artifacts, looking for shells, rocks, rock samples in pursuit of merit badges because he was a Boy Scout. His explorations led him into an area that was uh, the home of this man who lived hidden away in the woods. And Ted Casimir Jr. actually wrote a book called The Last Algonquin that's about Joe T Two Trees. His posture was straight, almost military, with shoulders held stiffly. He was quite tall, perhaps six feet, and lean to the point of boniness. Over his gaunt frame hung a patchwork of clothes made from fur, cloth, and leather. He said his name was Joe Two Trees. The story is uh, the coincidental meeting of my father who lived in this area as a boy uh, in the 1920s with a gentleman who, as it turned out, appears to have been the last indigenous Indian. And that Indian lived in the woods of Pelham Bay Park in the Bronx, which in those years was still reasonably wilderness. And he lived in the traditional way, the Stone Age fashion, of his ancestors. And this was well into the 20th century. During those waning days of summer in 1925, Joe found it excusable for many reasons to tell me all sorts of stories. He also made time to instruct me in many of the ancient ways that seemed to interest me. He said it was good that I learned Indian ways, for being Indian should not be lost completely. After my father died, I decided that I should probably sit and make some notes of all the stories he had told me. I was particularly careful, though, to be as true to the story as I received it from him uh, as I could possibly be. Um, the reason being that it was important to him, and I wanted to perpetuate whatever it was that he had wished to do. 
On my way home that evening, I perched for a short while on Glover's Rock to watch the sun fade. Looking toward Turtle Cove, I could almost convince my eyes that a dugout canoe cut quietly across its smooth water. I knew it wasn't, but I thought in the Maker's great plan, it was there only yesterday. The events in the story, as my father told them, seemed much too important to him to imagine that it wasn't a true story. So, the next time you cross a bridge or drive along the BQE, FDR, or Manhattan highways, think about New York from a different perspective. We promise that visiting or daydreaming about New York's island, empire, and the entire nautical community we call home is good for the soul. Yeah.